So the topic is dietary insulin inhibition as a metabolic therapy in advanced cancer. Um, this is based on our safety, uh, a very small pilot safety feasibility trial in 10 patients. Uh, and uh, how do I advance the slides? It's supposed to be with this as well. Okay. Okay. And uh, this was just accepted by uh, the Elsevier Journal uh, Nutrition. It's currently available if you uh, search it, if you have a, su a subscription either through your library or a, sub a subscription to Nutrition. It should be freely available online, I understand, through the publisher uh, around mid-September, so then it should be available to everybody, just, I think, on Google. Um, and uh, the print version should come out in October. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators, of course. Uh, the study was, uh, was done at Einstein Montefiore. Uh, C.J. Isaacson is uh, the principal nutritionist on the trial, uh, and Sylvia Hertzkoff, Maria Romano, Nora Tamuda, Amanda Bontempo were the uh, nutritionists uh, ably assisting her. Uh, Abdis and Agasa really helped a lot with the stati uh, statistics, uh, correcting some of my uh, naive ideas, and Joe Sperano, uh, my oncology collaborator. Uh, Richard Feynman sitting here has been my collaborator in co low-carb research for the last 10 years or so and remains my uh, biochemistry tutor, making me lazy about looking things up because I just call him up and say, well, what do you think about this? But anyway, uh, he and Anna Miller, Ed Quadros, and Jeff Sequeira at Downstate have also been involved with the cell culture studies. Uh, funding is through the uh, Robin and Veronica Atkins Foundation through the SUNY Research Foundation and... Uh, they also, of course, made this possible. Now, um, our interest in cancer goes back to uh, the energetics of low-carbohydrate diets, which is really a topic for another day, so I won't go into that at all. But that's really how I got interested in this. Uh, but my, uh, my day job is a nuclear medicine physician, and we, we look at uh, cancers by uh, studying them with uh, PET scans. A uh, PET scan is... Uh, a radioactive uh, tracer injected into a patient, and then we get images. And uh, for cancers, the radioactive tracer that's uh, very commonly used is fluorodeoxyglucose, where the fluorine is F18, the radioactive uh, portion. And that's what uh, lights up and allows you to see it. And you notice that glucose is part of the molecule, and FDG, as it's called, behaves a lot like glucose difference being that instead of being metabolized by the cancer, it just gets stuck and trapped there, so it makes it a little easier to see. So uh, this goes back really almost 100 years to Otto Warburg, who first described that uh, many cancers, particularly aggressive cancers, are dependent on glucose and uh, glycolysis, particularly anaerobic glucose metabolism, for their energy source. They can't metabolize fat they can't metabolize ketone bodies. They're restricted and limited to using glucose as their energy fuel. And this is what a PET scan looks like. I'm afraid the pointer is actually not working, but uh, if anyone has one that does, that'll help. Because uh, I'd like to be able to point here to the, uh, to the sides. But anyway, you can see on the left that there's... Ah, thank you. Okay, you can see here that uh, kind of the outline of the body is not as well seen, but you can, this is fluorodeoxyglucose. Uh, you can see the heart here, and you can see the kidneys because the FDG is excreted by the kidneys and then into the bladder and the urine. This is a little urinary contamination on the thighs. You can see the shape of the liver, but what you shouldn't see and what you do see are these metastatic deposits in the liver here. And these are the METs which the FDG is accumulating in. And that's really a fairly graphic demonstration of the glucose avidity and glycolytic dependence of these uh, metastatic tumors. This patient did pretty well, patient with colorectal cancer, metastatic to liver, because uh, chemotherapy shows resolution of the metastases in the liver. The heart is quite variable in uptake, by the way, because it depends on what the patient recently ate. Uh, you see the kidneys again, you see the bladder, you can see the liver, though, has resolved. Uh, this contrasts with another patient who didn't do as well, and you can see here that, once again, you do see the, um, uh, the kidney, renal pelvis, and urinary excretion system. Oh, thank you. 
this one. Okay, so now I have several of these. Um, that the uh, renal collecting system and ureter is seen, the other kidney, the bladder, the brain is in the field of view here, the heart and the liver. But here you see there's a single metastasis in the liver at this point, just one. But uh, this patient was given chemo because of metastases, and that met, that met persists. But unfortunately, you now see there are multiple mets in the liver, and there's also a met to the lung. So here, once again, you can see how a PET scan can be very dramatically uh, useful in demonstrating changes in the cancer over time. And many common aggressive cancers, in fact, depend on glycolysis, which is why PET scans are so useful. In fact, most cancers of the lung and colon and breast, which are quite common, of course, lymphomas and many other cancers. But uh, not all cancers are quite so dependent on glycolysis. This is just for completeness. You should be aware of that. Uh, about 80% of prostate cancers actually are uh, not so glucose avid. 20% are, but you know, quite a few are not. Uh, a variety of colon and a uh, small percentage of colon and lung cancers are not so glucose avid. Highly functional tumors, such as uh, very highly functional thyroid cancers, are often not glucose dependent. So the question really comes up is, can we take advantage of the fact that the metabolism of cancer is being so glucose dependent and not being able to use fat, fatty acids, not being able to use uh, ketone bodies, that cancers are less flexible than normal tissues. Or putting it a little bit more directly, if we decrease dietary carbohydrate, we don't actually starve the tumors. That was the first original and somewhat naive idea because blood glucose concentration doesn't usually change that much on these diets. But uh, decreased carbohydrate in the diet does decrease insulin secretion, and that can have a, a nice bunch of effects, we'll, which we'll discuss right now. First of all, um, just to show it happens, in this slide from Hernandez et al. And, and Bob Eccles, you can see that after meals, that insulin spikes. And these are th three different meals. This is a normal diet. This is a high-carb diet. I think it's backwards here. But on a high-fat diet, which is what they called it, which is actually a low-carb diet, it was actually about 20 grams of carbs a day, you can see that insulin secretion completely flattened out. All right, so it, wor it works. Low-carb diets really inhibit insulin very effectively. And many effects of insulin inhibition, which we'll just call this for short, can very plausibly inhibit cancers. This has actually been shown in a variety of animal and cell culture models, but just some of the metabolic responses, the systemic metabolic responses of in insulin inhibition, include reducing insulin-like growth factors, fatty acid synthase, an enzyme which is pretty important, it turns out, to many cancers for their cell membrane synthesis. Uh, ketosis and fatty acidosis itself has been shown to inhibit cancers. Fatty acidosis actually can cause apoptosis in a variety of cancers, uh, self-suicide by the cancers, uh, reduced inflammatory peptides. So there are a lot of metabolic responses that can plausibly inhibit cancers, and then some of these have been shown as well. The concentration of glucose itself, as I mentioned, uh, may not change that much and uh, remains in the physiologic range. Cancers have to be pretty clever about pirating glucose from the blood. They are, and so remaining in the normal physiologic range, the glucose concentration may not have so much of a role. Now, at the same time, in the last dozen years or so, uh, the topic of cell signaling has become extremely important in all f uh, aspects of medical and biomedical research, and that includes in, in the world of cancer. And many drugs are now being developed to target these cell signaling proteins uh, in cancer cells. So just a brief description of what that's about a little bit. Uh, these signaling proteins have something of the flavor of alphabet soup. You know, the, the names are often not very revealing. Uh, I don't know, mTOR uh, doesn't do anything for me. It stands for the mammalian target of rapamycin. And I don't think that's a very informative name. It doesn't tell you what it does. And in fact, the drug that's used to treat it is, of course, rapamycin. So, you know, it's a pretty circular kind of a thing. But anyway, mTOR is a signaling molecule within cells and is an important target. And there's another one, AMPK, 
that one actually means something, adenosine monophosphate kinase. But anyway, so there's PI3K, AKT, VEGFR, HIF1-alpha. These are molecules which are responsible for a variety of behaviors in all cells, not just cancer cells. And they're kinds of, uh, they're, they're responsible for things like growth and cell division and metabolism and a lot of other functions within cells. The problem in cancers uh, uh, very often is that there are gene mutations which cause these molecules to behave badly and cause them to behave sufficiently abnormally that they can lead, for example, in cancer cells to unlimited growth and unlimited division and invasion and immortality and things like that. And so that's why these drug, uh, drugs have been targeted to these kinds of molecules, hoping to, that the drugs will, in fact, stop the cancers from behaving so badly. That's what the idea is. Um, and, and examples of drugs now being developed to target important cell signaling proteins include rapamycin, which is also called sirolimus, evirolimus, which is a variant on the same drug, and others which sound like it too. A whole slew of drugs are targeted to PI3K, AKT. There are drugs targeted to fatty acid synthase, which is not only an enzyme, but is also a signaling molecule, by the way. Uh, VEGFR is inhibited by a drug. Uh, HIF1-alpha is inhibited by a variety of drugs. Metformin, which is used in diabetes, also inhibits AMP kinase. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, it doesn't inhibit AMP kinase. It upregulates AMP kinase, and that's very important, as it turns out. All right, so there are a lot of drugs, and they influence some of the molecules that are important in cancer growth and cancer behavior. Um, okay, notice the drugs, notice the molecules, and notice the arrows. Now, the problem is that these molecules all interact with each other. They exist within normal cells. They exist within cancer cells. In cancer cells, they're abnormal. But in fact, they all interact with each other, and they have feedback effects on each other. And drugs might be designed to target specific molecules in cancer cells, but the effects can't be limited to cancer cells. You're giving the drug, it's going to go to all cells in your body, and in fact, the drugs get into the normal cells where the feedback of one molecule on the other tends to cause unwanted side effects. And in fact, what's been observed in attempting to use these drugs in cancer is that the drugs are marked by counter-regulatory side effects from normal cells, and then the side effects limit the efficacy of the drugs. And one example from a study in Journal of Clinical Oncology is that 55 patients treated with the virulimus, which targets mTOR, a benefit was seen in only four out of the 55 patients, and it was limited because the patients developed uh, uh, hyperglycemia, high blood glucose, in response to this drug therapy. And in fact, so now they try to target cancers with more than one drug, with two drugs, and they use metformin, which is used to treat hyperglycemia. And they did a little better in this phase one trial. What they found was that, oops, six of 10 patients, which is a little bit better in a small pilot tr trial, had stable disease or partial remission. Okay, that's pretty good. And nonetheless, they all still had dose-limiting side effects. So uh, this is a simplified diagram that uh, is out there that shows uh, the various different cell signaling molecules. You can see here I have in the center, you see AKT, here's mTOR, here's PI3 kinase, uh, there's mTOR, there's AMP kinase, the variety of other ones. And you see arrows that interact between them. Some of the arrows are stimulatory and some of the arrows are inhibitory. They're all, you know, interacting with each other. Um, but one thing that you should note is that insulin receptor is right up here at the top, and all of these molecules are actually downstream of the insulin receptor. And not only are they downstream of the insulin receptor, but that the downstream effects of reducing insulin secretion hit the very same drug targets I just discussed, hits them in the same directions, and hits them simultaneously. And insulin inhibition is well tolerated by normal tissues. So it sort of raises the fairly obvious question, why not just target insulin inhibition, not with drug, but with something that's well tolerated, like diet? And uh, yeah, you notice the arrows, they're the same targets, and the arrows are in the same directions. So glucose is insulin's principal stimulus. Could we accomplish all these effects simply, all at the same time? 
Uh, the American diet for the past 30 years has basically been constituted by overconsumption of carbohydrate by recommendations, actually. We're eating, well, probably not the people in this room and at this conference, but many Americans are eating three to 400 grams of carbohydrates a day, which generally constitutes more than 50% of our calorie intake. Uh, and 90% of these carbohydrates are sugars or starches, which digest the sugars. And insulin inhibition, therefore, can probably be done most simply by decreasing total carbohydrate. Very low-carb di diets often target about 5% of total calorie intake as carbohydrates. So this is uh, something that we thought we might want to do. And they're safe. Uh, studies from three months up to two years have shown safety uh, formally. That's in normal weight men and people with type 2 diabetes and obesity uh, for reduced inflammatory biomarkers and so forth. Uh, the safety, by the way, of course, we also know just paleontologically that um, uh, that's part of our evolutionary heritage, and we'll get a little bit more into that just in a bit. Uh, there was also data from the literature that suggests that there's decreased cancer growth from reducing carbohydrates and the related effects of insulin inhibition. This has been shown in a variety of mouse tumor models, including by Tom Seyfried, who will be talking later about some of his work. Um, it's been shown in cell culture lines by a variety of investigators. Uh, we've looked at that as well. And in humans, uh, Linda Nibling in 1995 was the first to have reported on this. Again, Tom Seyfried has reported on this. And uh, Dr. Schmidt, a collaborator of Dr. Clement and Dr. Kammerer, have also uh, uh, described, described a, a study involving carb restriction uh, quite related to the one that we did. So uh, just to show the very first of these studies by the, uh, Niebling et al., which everyone quotes because it was the first, uh, they looked at two kids with brain cancers, and uh, just to quote from them, within seven days of the diet, blood glucose concentration declined to low normal, and ketone bodies increased 20 to 30-fold. The PET scan, which they used, showed a 22% decrease in glucose uptake at the tumor in uh, both of the kids, and one continued the diet for 12 months uh, free of disease progression. And in the one mouse model that I want to show, which was also from about 25 years ago, um, Tisdale uh, from the British Journal of Cancer looked at mice and implanted uh, human tumors in the flanks of the mice and uh, let them grow for about three weeks and then sacrificed the animals on five different diets. And uh, there were about five animals in each group. And the animals, uh, the diets were characterized by having a normal diet, which was high in carbs, and then substituted diets where fat was substituted for carbs. The fat was medium chain triglycerides. And so the more fat that was increased, this is 68% fat substitution, 68% plus ketone bodies, actually, beta hydroxybutyrate was added. 80% fat substitution, 80% plus ketone bodies. And the more fat that you substituted, the smaller the weight of the tumor was found at three weeks when the animal was sacrificed. So this goes back, you know, 25 years, and uh, it was quite interesting. So if we try to summarize what we're up to here. Carb restriction and insulin inhibition is well tolerated by normal tissues. Its metabolic effects plausibly can inhibit cancer growth, which has been shown in a variety of studies, and it can target proposed uh, therapy molecules simultaneously. It also could plausibly reduce then drug doses if it, if it synergizes with them, reduce the drug side effects, and then potentially increase the efficacy. We don't really consider carb restriction at this moment. Uh, we didn't really envision this as a monotherapy in cancer. And the reason we didn't envision it, you'll see for a variety of reasons, but nothing really works as a monotherapy in cancer. There's no reason to think this will too, and you'll see what our thinking is on that. But we do think that it can reduce drug side effects and increase efficacy. So many plausible mechanisms exist, as I described, for cancer's response to insulin inhibition both metabolically and molecularly, is there also an evolutionary rationale? And uh, first is hominid evolution. Uh, for about a million and a half years since Homo erectus, 
Man has evolved principally as a hunter-gatherer. And that generally means that when the hunt went well occasionally, uh, man would be blessed with a protein and fat-rich feast. And in the winter climes of Northern Europe, I'm sure that uh, there weren't really, there was no bread on the table and there were no cookies, cakes, and pies, and there's no ice cream and no crackers. But there were occasionally gathered nuts and berries, and it's likely we were ketotic most of the time. But aside from the paleontological evidence which has been collected, fasting is actually in our biochemistry. In modern man, fasting has no ill effects. This was shown beautifully, by the way, by a terrific study by Robert Owen and George Cahill from the Harvard School of Public Health in 1967 from Journal of Clinical Investigation, where he studied a morbidly obese people who he hospitalized for six weeks and gave them nothing. Well, he gave them water but um, nothing happened to them. Uh, but anyway, what he did show was that gluconeogenesis serves the brain for short-term fasts, and it manufactures glucose out of protein. And uh, that's uh, good for a short-term fast. It's not a good long-range strategy for our starving ancestors, um, but ketosis takes care of that because ketone bodies are manufactured from our fat stores. And so over, over a long-term fast, and Owen showed this, that after six weeks, our brain uh, metabolism was basically substituted for by about 75% ketone bodies. He didn't carry it out longer, so I don't know whether or not it becomes 90% ketone bodies later. But in any event, ketone bodies basically replace our need for carbohydrate and glucose in the brain for longer periods so that we can survive for as long as our fat stores hold out. And there is no known dietary requirement for carbohydrate has been expressed by many, including Eric uh, Westman. So what else could enable mechanisms of susceptibility? And I, I have these are linked because it's actually quite an intricate uh, relationship between human evolution, civilization, and cancer evolution. Civilization's recent. Civilization basically is equivalent to the development of agriculture and the wide abundance of vegetables, fruits, and grains, fruits of enormous size. Uh, but they're around for about 10,000 years compared to one and a half million years of evolution. And prosperity and nutrient excess, in particular carbohydrate excess, we can arbitrarily say is maybe 100 years old or perhaps particularly the last 30 years. And there's plausibly an absence, I think we could say, of sustained ketosis and the other effects of insulin inhibition in many people in the developed world. You know, there may be some exceptions during time of war and famine, and ironically in people who are on low-carb diets for obesity, but by and large, most of us are overfed with carbohydrates. So what else can enable mechanisms of susceptibility? And here we have to look at cancer evolution, because cancers evolve within each organism. Cancers are different within each organism. In fact, cancers are even different within the organism. But that's really a little more than I need to say right now. What I want to say is that cancers evolve from one abnormal cell, usually thought to be benign, until it becomes a trillion, a trillion malignant cells, which represent at least 35 to 40 doubling times, probably 60 to 80, uh, if you actually consider the numbers of cells that die along the way, until they reach a detectable volume of about 1 to 2 milliliters. And during these divisions, the cell has to mutate or die. Uh, in order to permit survival. Cells have a poor blood, uh, cancers particularly develop a poor blood supply, and that results in low oxygen tension for the cancers. And in order to develop abnormal and unregulated growth under these very hostile conditions, which ought to kill the cancer cells, but doesn't, the mutations permitted to survive, and, and the cancers also shift to anaerobic glycolysis. In the developed world, then, and within, each human organism, many cancers in our country and in, in recent years evolve under conditions of high carbohydrate, high insulin secretion, that's to say most of us. And that ketosis and other effects of a very low carb insulin inhib inhibition diet would represent an unfamiliar metabolic environment for large cohorts of individuals with cancers. Maybe not all, but large cohorts of individuals. So that insulin inhibition and ketosis is a state to which normal tissues are adapted, but cancers may experience as a new evolutionary selective pressure. This is very important. So the expectations for cancers under this new selective pressure of insulin inhibition 
is that the cancers would be plausibly vulnerable by mechanisms that we've discussed, but they might, they might be accidentally adapted because that's the nature of evolution. You don't know exactly what's going to happen when things evolve. They could be accidentally adapted to a low-carb insulin inhibitory state. All else being equal, and I have big question marks because how do we know? We might expect approximately equal distributions of cancers for vulnerability or remission, partial remission, stable disease, or possibly that they might be adapted to this insulin inhibitory state, in which case they'll continue to progress. However, there's at least the potential for stability and vulnerable disease. If we can get biomarkers to determine which is which, we're in business. Anyway, so to summarize the hypothesis, large cohorts of individuals with cancer in the developed world do not experience sustained ketosis or other features common to the insulin inhibitory very low carb state. And we'd expect many cancers to express a range of plausible vulnerabilities as well as accidental adaptations to this unfamiliar metabolic environment. Given the metabolic changes of this kind of a diet, and the effects on molecular targets, we basically thought that this kind of diet deserves a look. So we've decided to look in humans. We've done some cell culture studies, which we won't have time to discuss today. Uh, this, again, is the paper. <clears throat> and what the paper really is trying to do is to, uh, permit, is to perform a pilot study. It took a lot longer to do than we expected. It was hard to actually get patients recruited. It took about four years. Our goals were the goals of a safety and feasibility trial. Is the diet safe and feasible for 28 days in patients with advanced cancer? <clears throat> uh, in addition, the goal was to use an entry PET scan as an index of glucose dependency. And also, this permitted us, because of the high sensitivity of PET scanning, to use a change in the PET scan, just as the ones I showed you, between the entry and the exit as a surrogate marker of efficacy. So eligibility clearly required a positive PET scan to declare a tumor had glucose dependency. By the way, glucose dependency doesn't tell you that it's glucose, uh, that it's carbohydrate restriction sensitive. It just means that it's, it does have glucose dependency. Uh, patients have to have failed or refused chemotherapy because if you're doing an experimental trial, you have to, you have to do a trial of the, of the agent itself. You can't combine it with anything else yet. And uh, they couldn't be too thin. We would never have gotten it past the Investigational Review Board if these are thought to be weight loss diets, and uh, we couldn't choose patients who were too thin. So that's why it was hard to get patients. And these patients couldn't be too sick or too frail. And we tried a two to three day trial diet to preview patient tolerance and compliance. We didn't want patients to hate it. We wanted to give them a chance to actually do it. The goal was 28 days under dietitians' guidance to help them stay on the diet. We targeted about 5% of energy uh, as, uh, in other words, a very low-carb diet. Patients came back for weekly visits so we could talk to them, we could examine them. They could give us their official food recall uh, records. They wrote it down so to try to make it as accurate as possible. We got a standardized office weight on a standard scale, and we got bloods for a variety of things, and most notably for beta-hydroxybutyrate, ketone body, in order to uh, <clears throat> basically measure compliance. Rather than depending on the patient's food recall records, this was a biochemical measure of both compliance and metabolic responsiveness all at once. So that was the best measure that we had. And the rationale for a one-month duration was that, well, we knew from nuclear medicine uh, oncology studies that you can see changes as early as a week in uh, chemo. In lymphomas, you can see changes in less than a week. And in fact, the changes are very pr predictive that that's, that that's the chemo that's going to work. And that um, very low-carb diets in humans have shown changes at eight weeks. That was the study I showed you from Linda Niebling. In rodents, we knew that as little as three weeks, you could see changes, smaller uh, tumors, in as little as three weeks. So four weeks seemed to be a reasonable period of time where we could see a change and, uh, on a PET scan. And um, ketosis begins usually within three or four days of the onset of such a diet, so it seemed as though we were giving them an adequate time to respond. 
And finally, uh, this is a safety and feasibility trial, and we wanted to give patients a chance to succeed. Uh, diet is not easy for anybody. It's not easy in obesity. Most people uh, start on a diet, and then within a few months, they fall off the diet. But I think if you speak to uh, dietitians and you speak to people or anyone who's tried a diet, almost anyone can stay on a diet for a month. So we figured this was a reasonable compromise. Now, as far as the baseline data here, um, there's a lot of data in this slide, but I think what I want you to see is that uh, the age range was from about 52 up to 73. There were seven women and three men. Uh, we didn't have the luxury of picking a single cancer type. We selected patients not by cancer type, but by phenotype, were they glucose avid cancers. So they had to have a positive PET scan. That was the selection criteria. And the diets were safe in all 10 patients. All patients completed at least 26 of 28 days. If they stopped short, it wasn't because of an unsafe effect of the diet. Two patients had scheduled vacations. As far as they knew, this was the last vacation they ever were going to have. They had plane tickets, and we couldn't tell them not to go. So we got their PET scan a couple of days early. You know, one patient had a dental abscess because of poor dentition, needed an extraction, and we just had to give this patient the availability of softer foods rather than eating meat. So, you know, things like that. But none of the patients stopped due to an unsafe effect of the diet itself. Now, one important factor is that this patient was biologically different. You can see that all the patients had several years of cancer and had had several kinds of chemotherapy which had been failing, which made them eligible for this trial. This patient with breast cancer had refused standard therapy for 14 years. She never had surgery. She never had chemo or radiation. But she was still alive, and so she, her cancer was clearly more slow-growing and indolent than the others although it was quite advanced. We had pictures from six years before our trial which showed chest wall invasion. So she was growing very slowly. And this is important because she had to be considered somewhat differently when we looked at efficacy. And uh, the only way we could evaluate safety, since uh, she, was, you know, she was safe on a low-carb diet, <laughs> apparently, uh, she wasn't was happening to her, was as long as she didn't have any adverse effects due to the diet, she would be considered safe. But efficacy was different. We'll come to that. So some of the physiologic effects of the diet in these 10 patients, uh, most prominent being that despite our best efforts, uh, the patients experienced a calorie deficit and they lost weight. One patient was weight stable, but most of the patients lost some weight. We didn't want this to happen. We were targeting weight maintenance. It was our expectation that uh, we could overfeed patients and keep them weight, weight stable but um, possibly for the reasons that people do lose weight on low-carb diets, that they did too. They were perhaps, uh, ketosis perhaps uh, did suppress their appetite. We couldn't get them to, uh, to stay weight stable. Um, there was a mild change in blood glucose, not statistically significant. Carbs were in fact restricted rather uh, seriously, 27 grams on average. Now, their predicted energy needs were about 1,900 calories, but by their food recall records, they were about a third deprived, a third energy deficit, and they lost weight, as I just mentioned. Now, um, this patient number three is the one that we exclude from analysis. She didn't have much ketosis. Of course, she didn't have any ketosis, presumably, when she was on her standard diet either, and she was stable, but she was stable anyway, so we excluded her from analysis. Of the other nine patients, uh, five of them showed either partial remission or stable disease. You can see that the ketosis compared to baseline was rather brisk in these five patients. Patients with progressive disease, there was one patient who had a decent ketosis, but the other three did not. So the metabolic response of the patients with progressive disease was qualitatively different from the patients who had stable disease or partial remission. And this is, uh, we believe, a significant finding. If we compare the calorie deficit and some uh, investigators believe, believe that uh, it's calorie restriction that has uh, the benefits of increasing longevity and possibly in cancer restriction as well, uh, and cancer control as well. At least in our study, which is rather small, uh, we didn't see any difference in the calorie deficit between the patients who had stable disease, partial remission, versus those with progressive disease. 
Uh, same thing is true of weight loss. Uh, one criticism is also potentially that since we did have weight loss, weight loss has also been thought to be possibly responsible for the benefit of low-carb diets, but we didn't see any difference in stable disease versus progressive disease in the extent of weight loss. But we did see, as I showed you in the individual data and also here in the mean data, that the ketosis was threefold higher in the patients with um, stable disease partial remission compared to those with progressive disease. In addition, the ketosis and the insulinemias, uh, insulinemia in the patients were inver inversely correlated, as you'd expect. Low-carb diets should stimulate insulin secretion, so that this was also true and statistically significant. And so, uh, in summary, uh, this was a prospective trial of a macronutrient change, specifically carbohydrate restriction as a cancer therapy. Uh, ten patients completed the trial without unsafe adverse events. The metabolic effect uh, ketosis was observed. Its extent correlated with insulin inhibition, as expected from a very low-carb diet. The extent of ketosis also correlated with disease stability, also significantly which was consistent with the hypothesized effects of insulin inhibition on glucose-dependent cancers. And there was unplanned calorie restriction and weight loss, which was observed, but this was uncorrelated uh, with the effects of disease stability. So uh, future directions, we'd hope that this uh, small pilot study could be extended into a larger trial to confirm or refute the findings. Uh, we would love to be able to try an insulin-inhibiting diet as an adjunct to other forms of therapy, whether metabolic, molecular, or standard chemotherapies. Uh, we'd also like to explore the relation of carb restriction to calorie restriction in animal models as well as in humans, because this is an area of great interest and some controversy. And, of course, it's important for us somehow to find useful biomarkers of why some patients are susceptible and others do not appear to be susceptible to this approach. So I guess that's it. Thanks very much. Probably have time for one or two questions. Thank you. Is this on? Um, I noticed that you're not tracking liver function tests. So is there a point where if liver function is compromised that this would not be a good therapy? Well, we, we did actually monitor liver function. We wanted to make sure the patients didn't have any significant end, or, end organ disease when we started. The patients couldn't, we just didn't want sick people, you know, because they had to act, these patients were outpatients, they had to prepare their own food, you know. We, but. Um, so I, I can't tell you at, at what point liver function, you know, would exclude a patient from, from this kind of an approach. I just don't know. Okay. Yeah. And then quickly on the weight loss, is it possible these patients were already losing significant weight beforehand, and did you track that? Yeah, the patients had to be, I didn't mention, the patients had to be weight stable for three months, oh, basically, be okay, before that. they entered the trial. I didn't mention that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, great talk, Dr. Fine. Thank you. Um, so I'm a radiation oncologist, so I'm clearly biased towards that uh, route. But... It, one thing to note as well, in a lot of these cancer patients, radiation is standard of care. And there is a significant amount of data showing that when you restrict these cells from carbohydrates and cause a lot of ketones, they actually can't fix the oxidative damage from radiation. So for me, that's been the avenue that I've been going down to convince people to go on a ketogenic diet during radiation. But uh, I think it shows that there's a lot of potential here in a lot of different routes, and we only begin to explore those. Yeah, it's true. I mentioned synerg synergies with chemo, but yeah, synergies with radiation therapy would make sense too. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, last question. Okay. Hi, Dr. Fine. It's really good to see you again. I saw yeah, you nice three years you. ago, and you changed the way I worked out um, and changed my. I think about you often over the last three years, just to let you know. And one of the things I've done is when I work out, I do uh, a 15 hour, 12 to 15 hour fast beforehand. And my thinking is, that I'm 
draining all of my glycogen stores rather than carving up, which most Americans do, I enter a workout in a fasted state. So I suck all that glycogen out of my muscle stores and basically, you know, become insulin resistant for a time to spare glucose for the brain. But, you know, subsequent hours later, I become that much more insulin sensitive. And also I take some sodium bicarbonate before a workout to really have an alkaline um, environment. So it, it, it basically negates some of the lactic acid buildup. So it's kind of both of those questions relate to in this study, would you ever consider how um, interventions such as uh, strength training to uh, increase insulin sensitivity and or the uh, acid slash alkaline environment would uh, further uh, support your work? Well, you said a lot of stuff. Um, I, I think that um, increasing insulin sensitivity uh, by exercise is, uh, you know, is, is something that uh, everyone wants to do <laughs> and I think would help um, the uh, we, we're dealing with diet because these kinds of patients I think uh, it's, it's probably harder to get them to to undergo meaningful exercise but you know there was one patient actually who was do, uh, despite advanced cancer was uh, clinically pretty well and was actually playing uh, doubles tennis three times a week and, and singles a couple of times and doing a lot of gardening so he was he was pretty active yeah you know, anyway. <laughs> That's all the time we have. Thank you.